Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave, and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. But the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand, and he's running really fast. And spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. 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 Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way it works for me, just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, we offer that as a member to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. All you got to do is hit the join button, become a member. You get access to all the member shows, plus ad-free listening on the Tuesday shows and overtime segments available on the website and the Confessionals app. We have our own app now. You can go ahead and download it from Apple or Google Play. And it's a members exclusive app. So if you're not a member, you don't have access to this app. This is just for the members. So if you're a member and you haven't done so yet, go ahead and download the app, get yourself logged in and enjoy the exclusive nature of the Confessionals app. All right, friends, we are going to the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference. First, I was a vendor. Now I'm a speaker. What am I going to be speaking about? I'm not sure yet. And when I know, I'm not going to tell you. You got to show up to see what we're talking about that day. But I am a speaker at the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference this year. I'm pretty excited about it. And after the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference in July, I am speaking in Gatlinburg at a live show being pulled off by Hillbilly Horror Stories and myself in Gatlinburg, Tennessee on September 30th. Go ahead and get your tickets now. Tickets available for that show and the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference are available in the description of this episode. So if you're interested in either one of those shows, the tickets are available in the description. Go ahead, check out the links and get your tickets. And last but not least, we have EMP Shield. That is the walking sponsor of the show on a weekly basis. All you got to do is go to EMPShield.com, shop around, get yourself devices that will protect your vehicles from EMP blasts, solar flares, or lightning strikes. And upon checkout, go ahead and use promo code Tony and get yourself $50 off of every device you purchase. So go ahead, check it out, EMPShield.com. And if you haven't seen Expedition Dogman, go ahead, check it out. It's on Amazon, Tubi, and on demand at Merkel.media. It's the first film we came out with. Some people haven't seen it yet. Go ahead, check it out if you want to see the journey we went on hunting Dogman in Kentucky. We're coming out with our new film, The Shape of Shadows, coming out soon, early summer. You guys are going to dig it where me and my team went out to Utah looking for the shapeshifters out there. We had a lot of wild experiences while we were there, and we're going to share it with you on our new film, The Shape of Shadows. Okay, this week we have Pastor Didio coming on the show, and I think I said it right. I didn't check before I started recording this. Him and I were working on his last name before we started recording, and I think he said it rhymes with video, so Didio, video, video, Didio. I think we're going to go with that. Pastor Didio on the show. And listen, I came across Pastor Didio on Instagram. I fell in love with his Instagram reels. 
Him and his team do a great job, and I wanted to bring him to the table today because he talks about things in the Bible that not a lot of preachers talk about these days. And the first thing that I saw of his was he was talking about portals to hell, and I was like, oh, this is my kind of guy. So let's get Pastor Didio on the show right now. All right, today we got Bishop Alan Didio. That's it. Yes. Oh, sorry. Awesome. <laughs> we, we were just discussing, uh, making sure I said it right, and I did good. So good, because I'm actually, I, I, I really butcher people's names at times. So uh, I, I butcher my own name from time to time. <laughs> if, you, if you're upset, if you're frustrated, if you're excited, Didio can come out all kinds of ways. Yeah. Uh, but it's actually Italian. It means of God. Didio means of God. Really? Okay. That's perfect, actually, for, for your I mean, uh, line of work. Well, I was an atheist. Imagine being an atheist with that name uh, as a 17-year-old and uh, trying to run from that. It didn't work, so here we are. Yeah, it was already written, <laughs> literally, <laughs> yeah. several times. I, I actually, when I used to drive tractor-trailer, I, I, uh, I worked with a guy. His name was Guy Mazzelli, and I didn't know how to pronounce his last name at first. And so he was an older man. I mean, he actually died while he was working there from cancer. And mm. he, uh, we were walking up the dock one day and I just said, and he kind of like adopted me as like a, like a, a work grandson, you know, he kind of treated me good and he was a grumpy person. And, uh, and I said to him, guy, how do I pronounce your last name? And he just looked at me. He's like, I don't even know. <laughs> and, and so I was like, okay, perfect. <laughs> I don't even know. So that's one person I don't have to worry about messing up their name. Cause he doesn't even know. So, um, so let me just lay out the groundwork here for the audience. Uh, how I found you. Uh, I found you on Instagram. And I always tell people that I hang out on Instagram a lot. And that's kind of the social media uh, platform that I, I prefer. And uh, those Instagram reels have become very popular over the last couple of years. And I still haven't conquered the idea of how to make good Instagram reels. Yeah. But you guys have. And uh, oh, come on. I'm telling you, man, like it, it, the, from first of all, the thumbnails. So when somebody finds your Instagram, they venture to your Instagram, the thumbnails they see, they just want to keep clicking, keep clicking. Oh, it's so good to hear. Yes, it's perfect. Uh, but the content is also great. And also for somebody like me who is has a paranormal podcast, talks about all this crazy, bizarre stuff that, you know, your quote normies of the world would say is impossible, doesn't exist. Uh, it was really cool to see a pastor talking about some things that like, I talk about on the show, but also relating it to the Bible. And uh, you talk a lot about revelation and end times and prophecy. And I'm just like, I like this guy. <laughs> and so uh, I, I was really uh, elated that you got back to me on, on Face or on Instagram. And then, you know, I arranged everything through email to have you on the show. Uh, but if, for the audience, if you could just maybe give them a 30,000 foot view of who you are as a pastor and all that stuff. I know it's not like you're just, oh, I'm an Instagram person. That's what I do. Like you do a lot of right. stuff. Well, first of all, it's so exciting to be here, man. Uh, since we connected with you and started looking into your stuff, you've got some amazing content yourself. So we've been really excited about connecting with you and doing this interview just to be able to, you know, kind of fellowship a little bit and learn more about what's happening in your space because we ourselves are strange and unusual. So we we love it when we bump into somebody else who's kind of a kindred spirit. Yeah. But I was an atheist, as, as I mentioned earlier, at 17 years of age, I'd have been in jail more times than I'd like to admit by that time. And I had a actually a demonic encounter uh, that then led to an encounter with Jesus and that radically transformed my life. And I immediately went from a radical, rabid atheist to a radical, rabid, spirit-filled uh, Christian who had been born again and transformed. And I was just hungry for the things of God. And since that time, I've traveled around the world. I've started churches, worked with the underground church in China and in the Middle East and Muslim countries. And, and I've encountered some really unusual, supernatural things in that time. And so uh, I, I always approach these issues with kind of a hint of skepticism that kind of that atheist in the, in the back of my mind is always has to have questions answered. But at the same time, I've seen things that I cannot deny. And I'm always interested in sharing those things because I think the world out there is interested. They realize there's more to life 
than just naturalism. There's more to life than what we can just see. There's something beneath the surface. And if the church doesn't begin to answer those questions, they're going to go somewhere else to get those questions answered. And so that's that's one of the reasons why we've we started doing what we're doing on TikTok and on Instagram and and on YouTube. That's awesome. That's awesome. I agree with you. Uh, the The reality is people are experiencing really weird things that they're told throughout their childhood doesn't exist. Monsters don't exist. You don't have to look in the closet. There's nothing there. And when you're as a kid or as an adult and you're experiencing that, all of a sudden you're thinking, well, the logical conclusion is I'm crazy and I can't right. talk about it or else I'll go in a home. And so it's, it, I think it's really important for people like yourself and even like me to be willing to talk about this stuff because yeah. those people who are experiencing things will seek answers. And, uh, and you and I had that conversation before we started about how uh, it's been kind of, that, that, that this conversation has been kind of really neglected a lot by a lot of mainstream Christianity. And uh, I, I'm really glad you guys are not shying away from it. Um, if well, you, Satan comes as an angel of light, right? He'll come as an angel of light. And so when we look at a lot of the paranormal things that are happening in our world from uh, UFO sightings to, to Bigfoot to portals to hell, all these things that are seem to me, from my perspective at least, from my travels around the world, can at times be demonic or satanic uh, distractions to keep people away from centralized truth that we find in the word of God. And so I want to make sure that we're answering questions from a biblical perspective and from my personal experience, which is unique, having traveled around the world, I may have seen some things and encountered some things that could be helpful for viewers to know that one, they're not crazy or two, maybe they are either way there's freedom in Christ. And that's our, Amen. that's our position. Right on. Uh, well, with with that said, you mentioned about how you had a demonic encounter that led to your encounter with Christ. Uh, how did that whole story play out? Well, I, I'd been invited. It's a long story. So I'd have been, been invited to a church service, and I, I'd never been to a Pentecostal church service, by the way. I wouldn't even know what a Pentecostal church service was. And, and they took me into that service telling me it was just going to be full of good music. They had a guest band, and I, I'm a lover of all kinds of music. Even to this day, I just, I just love music. So I went in to just see the music. I said, okay, we'll sit in the back. And so if anything hokey goes on, I can just kind of scoot out. Somehow we got on the second row center aisle and, and I'm sitting there and this is a Pentecostal church service. I mean, they're, they're doing all the, all the stuff that Pentecostals are known to do, including people falling down on the ground. I'm like, I got to get out of here. And as moment I say that the minister points at me and begins to uh, speak over my life as if God is speaking over my life, saying, I'm going to make you an example of what I can do with a young man sold out to God. And it laid his hands on me, prayed for me. And I left there not believing, fuming. I was furious that we, you and I were talking about your testimony. I was legit angry. I mean, I was seeing stars. I was so angry that my friend invited me into that cult. And yet a few days later, they were having some sort of youth get together with food. And I figured, you know, food and girls, what's the big deal? I'll go. And I went back a few days later and I was so, there was this cloud of oppression over my life that I, I can't explain to, well, I can't explain, but it's not explainable except from a Christian worldview. It, it, I could barely even hold my head up by reason of just this dark cloud of oppression. And I walked into that church and they're playing ping pong and foosball. And this is, this is before uh, we had all the high tech stuff you can do now. And, and when teens get together, but it was this loud room and I sit, sat over in the corner, just thinking in my head, you don't believe in any of this. You need to get out of here. You don't want anything to do with this. Get out of this place right away. Thinking those were my thoughts. And as I sat there, all of a sudden it felt like I was sucked into a tunnel. All of a sudden the sound around me was muted and all I could hear was that thought, which was now audible, and I could tell it was satanic, it was demonic, it was hideous, and it was weak. It was desperate, and it was saying, you don't believe in any of this. You need to get out of here. You need to leave this place. And I mean, it shook me so much. I looked up, and I could see people playing and talking. I could see their mouths moving, but I couldn't hear the words that were coming out of their mouth. All I could hear audibly was, get out of here. You don't want anything to do with this. And I recognize in that moment, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a theologian. This is the voice of Satan. And if Satan is real, then chances are Jesus is real. So I simply said, Satan, you can't have me anymore. Jesus, I'm all yours. I mean, I didn't know what else to do. 
And so I stopped all of the, all of the activities. I didn't know the Bible says in the book of Romans with the heart, you believe, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But for some reason, I felt like I had to tell everyone in the room. So I stopped everything and I told everybody what had just happened to me. And brother, this just, this weight just lifted this cloud lifted off me. And in an instant, it's, it's supernatural. All bondages. I didn't know I had weights. I didn't know were weighing me down instantly gone. The moment I gave everything over to Jesus and that's available to anybody, anywhere, anytime. I think often we ourselves are listening to thoughts that did not originate with us. And if, if they are discouraging, if they are condemning, if they are demonic, then you can cast those things off. You can take authority over those things. And since then, I've just been kind of a sold out, drop dead Jesus freak, man. It's just ever since that day, I've just been traveling the world, telling people, going places where it's illegal to preach the gospel, telling people what's happened to me. And it's been a wild ride. It sounds like it. I So I didn't know that. And so when I was telling you about kind of my experience, it sounds very similar in the sense that you yeah. were furious. I was furious. Like we're all mad at God until God's like, you know, comes knocking <laughs> on the door and I was like, oh, okay, never mind. Take, take that back. You're awesome. You know? <laughs> and so <laughs> right. uh, that's, well, we're just mad that somebody, what, what, what we get angry at is somebody's peeling back the scab. And we're just, we're just angry that we're getting a shot. You know, the, the, the initial pain of the exposure of, of first of all, letting go of our sin, letting go of the lives that we want to live. That's, that's painful. And most of the time, that's what I encounter. Most of the people who are resistant, who are angry, what they're really frustrated with is they've got some things that they want to hang on to. And it's painful to peel back that layer of pain and of trauma of things that have happened to you in your life. But if you just give it to Jesus, he'll just heal it all. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You, you, what you're saying reminds me when I, when I became a Christian, I, um, I remember one of the thoughts that I was dealing with, it, it was a struggle is that I was so instantaneously transformed that I, I felt like I was going to, uh, come across as uh, a flake and, uh, and, and as, um, like, like what, all right. So I was telling you how as a truck driver, I was really a, a mean person and I was so transformed instantaneously that I thought if I went to back to work, this transformed guys would think that, you know, this guy is just loony, loony tunes, you know, he's, he's great. Exactly. Like he just, yep. you know, give him a few weeks. He'll, he'll let it wear off kind of thing. And, uh, and I did, I, and I didn't know how to handle that. And I, I really was struggling with it. And I, I just, I just went in and did, did my thing. I was just, I was just myself. And when guys asked me, you know, they, they'd ask me some kind of question. I'd just be honest with them and like, listen, man, I had a really transfor transformational experience at a, at a funeral last weekend, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and the, the cool thing was they all, the, none of the, none of them accused me of any kind of cult or anything mm -hmm. like that. And over time, people started coming to me, asking me godly type questions and stuff. And I was just like, this is crazy. That's like awesome. truckers, are you kidding me? <laughs> so, yes. Uh, that's truckers love Jesus too. You know, they told me that too, by the way, they said, Oh, well, you know, you're just excited. That'll wear off brother. It's been like a quarter of a century and it's worse <laughs> than it's ever been. It's just, I mean, it's just gets worse and worse. I get more and more passionate and excited about these things as, as the years go on. Yeah. And I, I feel, I find, I find myself the same way. I find myself the same way. And it, it kind of, for me, amplified a lot when I had my kids for some reason, oh, uh, yeah. it, it just amplified a lot. And, and so yeah. the, it, it's like, Oh, you think you're transformed? Watch this, you know? <laughs> so, uh, well, your exposure to the divine kind of love, because there's a different kind of love when you're a child, your love for your parent is very different than whenever you grow older and you fall in love with your spouse. It's a very different kind of love and you can't experience that until that happens. But when you have a child, it is a certain kind of love. I mean, the moment that child was born, Something happened to you, didn't it? I mean, it was like yeah. instantly. And I think that's the love of God being imparted to us. That when we look on that child, what we're feeling there, if God is love, we're experiencing an impartation of that kind of divine love that's very transformative. Absolutely. You know, and we're going to get to the topic at hand here, but I want to say something off that. Um, so this past Sunday was Easter Sunday, and uh, my pastor was talking about, you know, the love of God and the fact that he, he would let his son die for all of mankind. And, and, and I mentioned to you earlier about how he talked to me during the service my pastor did. And this is what he was talking about. Cause he said, Tony, would you, with as much as you love your son, would you sacrifice him, let him die for a hundred people? And I was like, not a chance. 
not a chance, not happening. Like, and and to, to, to sit here and say, not only did God do that for billions of people, but he knew that of the billions of people, there would be a huge trunk, a chunk of them that would outright disrespect the death right. of his son. Wow. Like, like that's on that, that, that kind of love is I, I can't fathom, you know? And so I, like when, when I was sitting there on Sunday and I started really thinking about the fact that there are billions of people who not only say, I don't accept that, but they disrespect the act that happened. That's provable mm. that has happened. It, it, it's just like, that's on another level, you know? And so I, I just yeah. was like, whew, you know? So anyways. It's incomprehensible. The length, the very breadth, much. the height, to know the love of Christ is, it's supernatural. You can't even really, really begin to understand it until you receive it by faith. It has to be received by faith because it's so incomprehensible. You can't, it can't be calculated. It can't be distilled or experimented with. It is beyond our mental capabilities. That's the reason why it has to be first received by faith. And then it becomes experienced as you, as you go through your life. Right. So through, uh, these conversations that we're having here, uh, we're, we're talking about the reality of a spiritual existence. There is a God, the creator. Uh, there are, a, a, there's a huge chunk of people that are, that, uh, at least I've been seeing that are having a hard time accepting that hell is a real place. They want to accept that, that, that God is real, but they're not totally sure that hell is real or that, that God would actually send somebody to hell, all that stuff. Right. And I, I, I kind of want to move into this, what, what I first saw you on, which was the portals to hell. And I, I say this because I think that people who aren't really plugged in, uh, they don't, totally understand what their science that they follow, which has become their God, uh, says. And when you have, I'm sure you've heard of CERN uh, and, and that facility, like in, I think it's, it's, it's in a main part of that facility on the floor is a mural of demonic entities crawling out of the ground like a portal to hell. And so when, you, when I saw that on Instagram, I was like, that's the imagery that I have in my head. And I'm like, even the science of the day admits that there is another side and it's, it's not always the best side. Uh, but are there portals to hell? I mean, what, what, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a fascinating subject and, and I always use it as a springboard for the gospel because people are very interested in these kinds of things. And I've done videos about Mount Hecla in Iceland and the Huska house and uh, I think it's in uh, the north of Prague in the Czech Republic, which we can talk about. That's one of the most fascinating ones, I think, uh, that I've run into. But biblically speaking, and, and this is really interesting, the spiritual world and the natural world are not separated. They're not two separate things. They are, the, in fact, the natural world came out of the spiritual world. So it was born of the spirit. So which is more real? Well, obviously the, the spirit world. So we often think of heaven as being this ethereal place where we're floating out in the distant nothingness. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's a real place, just as real. And then when we begin to walk through scripture and we get to places like, well, in first of all, in the book of Genesis, when we see the Garden of Eden, there are seeds that are planted there from heaven. That's a whole nother conversation in and of itself. So we have spiritual seeds planted in natural earth, and there's such a commonality between the two that it's able to spring up. Then we get into Genesis chapter six, and we see the sons of God um, marrying the daughters of men and having children. So we have these angelic beings, spiritual beings, mating with natural beings, creating a supernatural being the the Nephilim or the giants, which I'm sure you've done some programs on. And that, that could be an interesting, Absolutely. an interesting conversation as well. So what that shows us is there's a compatibility between the natural and the spiritual that we don't often think of. So when we talk about hell, Jesus spoke about hell more than he did about heaven. And he spoke of it as an actual, a real place. In fact, in Matthew chapter number 16, he's walking with his disciples along the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And I've been to Israel multiple times. I can tell you this is a real place. And he comes to a place called the gate of the gods. And it was believed that this place here was a portal to hell. And this is where um, he says, who do you say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're Jeremiah or one of the John the Baptist or one of the prophets raised from the dead. And he said, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven, revealed this to you. And I say on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against it. And he's standing, they're standing actually at the gates of hell. There are all these notches in the rock where people would come and bring offerings. There was one God in particular at that spot where people believed that if you infuriated that God, he would cause an hysteria to come on you, a, a panic to come on you, and cause you to go insane. This was the God Pan. That's where the word panic comes from, that if you didn't appease him, you would just kind of lose your mind in hysteria. You would panic in fear. And this is where Jesus was when he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So I think Jesus in that moment is referring spiritually to gates, access points. And I think certainly there are portals, there are places where there are spiritual access points, where demonic entities are able to get access into people's lives. But it's interesting that even in science, as you say, from CERN to the, I think it's uh, the uh, Oak Ridge um, yeah. National Laboratory in Tennessee, it's looking for portals. They're trying to create some some portals. So um, and I don't want to keep talking because uh, you know I don't want to filibuster, but no, I think didn't. it was Eric, Eric Weinstein, who's a, a famous mathematician. He's got a tremendous, a, a famous podcast, not a believer as far as, as far as I know, seen on the Joe Rogan podcast. He talks about the common mythologies that we have and the importance of discovering the underlying truth. So he goes and he looks at Alice in Wonderland. He looks at the matrix. He looks at the Chronicles of Narnia. He looks at all this mythology and this lore. And he says, could it be that we're always writing about portals because there are actual portals around us, access points mm. where heaven can reach earth? Um, Jacob in, in Genesis 28, he encounters a portal where he sees a ladder going from heaven to earth and angels ascending and descending. This is wild stuff. And I don't know why we don't, we don't preach this in our services because it's, if, if it was there then, it's still here now. Satan hadn't gone anywhere, by the way. Satan is still here. He's still the God of this world, according to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul called him that. And so I think we need to call these things out and recognize, yeah, these spiritual beings are real. They are active in the earth. There are access points. And when people make note of this, instead of just dismissing it, maybe we use that as a bridge to share with them how we have authority over the devil through Jesus, and we don't have to be worried about an eternity in hell because we're redeemed from it. Yeah. A lot more to talk about, but... Yeah, no, it's, it's wild. Uh, I'm so glad you brought up Oak Ridge because uh, it's in my backyard. I live about 40 minutes from there. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's since living here, I've, I'm telling you, the stories that I've heard about that place is out of a science fiction movie. Really? Oh my gosh. And I I wish some of the stuff I could cover on my show, but uh, the people involved, they're friends of mine and I don't want to get them in trouble at work. Uh, but one thing I've said on the show before- the information and I'll do some stuff. Right, on. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I have said on the show, uh, so- and I probably shouldn't have, but I did. So it's already out there. The audience knows is that uh, I have a friend who has told me that they he works there, and I'm trying to I'm trying to say it more responsibly these days. Um, I have been told by two people that work there. They're both friends of mine that they are that that the security over there is instructed to not only protect against terroristic things but also things that might come out of portals. And uh, one story being that when they did open a portal, because apparently it has happened, that uh, what came through sounded so terrifying, it left it left everybody in the room screaming for their life. Uh, and so that was the story related, related to me by two separate people. And um, so are portals real in my mind? Absolutely. <laughs> And what you're talking about is access points. And so that's something that that I, I, I think about a lot. Um, the thinning of a veil in certain geographical yes. locations and there being uh, occultic people who understand that and utilize those, those locations for their means and purposes. Uh, not too long ago, I think it was episode 512, I think it was. Uh, I, I did a whole episode of this guy, James, he was in Joshua Tree, California. And he had a wild couple days out there. And a lot of people said that, oh, he was just on drugs. I don't think he was on drugs because some of the information that he shared, I, I dug into and it turns out he was spot on. 
And it, it's, it seems like there is uh, an annual uh, party slash ritual that goes on out there. And what he experienced was literal portals opening up uh, and things coming through. Uh, and I, I can only, and I also, I strongly believe that there was uh, what is known to be a, um, a satanic high wizard. Uh, and I say high wizard because I had a guy on my show back in like episode 60 something years ago. Uh, his name is Zach King. And he was a satanic high wizard where he was paid. His job was to travel around casting spells for kings, queens, high celebrities. And he described what he wore. And he said that what he would wear like a top hat, an old timey type of clothing, like a suit, and his face would be painted white. And in the one music video by Pink, I think it's called Like a Pill or something like that back in the day, um, there, he said there's a high wizard in that video casting spells while the video is being shot. And you could see him. And so like anybody can go see that video and see what he's talking about. He's like, that's what I looked like. That's what I dressed like before I came to Christ. And, mm. um, and so fast forward to this episode I'm telling you about, James tells me that uh, he, there was a guy walking around in a Mad Hatter hat and it just went over my head. Didn't even think about it until some, one of the listeners brought it to my attention. Do you think that could be a high wizard? And so what I did is I took that screenshot from that pink music video, sent it to James, and I said, did the guy look like this? And he said, during the day, he didn't have as much face paint, but at night, he looked just like that. And I was like, wow. dude, you had a high wizard there, and no wonder why you had some crazy stuff happening. But the fact is, I believe they're there every year because I've had other people come to me telling me very similar stories from that location. I think there's an access point there, a thinning of a veil. And so let me ask you this. On that note, uh, if there's access points, if there's thinning of veils at certain locations, are those places that in your mind, this might, this might, you may not have an answer to this, uh, but are those places that should be considered dangerous to the point that, uh, that we should do something about it and try closing these portals through prayer or something? Or do you think that they are natural because God has designed creation to be that for his own purposes? Oh, what a great question. And again, this is something as far as the thinning of the veil and that there are certain places uh, that are access points. This is something we've known for millennia. This is something that every society, every civilization has known until us. We're the ones who are too sophisticated to recognize what's right in front of our face. And and this is something, let me say this to the listeners, you don't want to play with this. You don't want to play with this. You don't. You don't want what's coming through the veil. We have a spirit guide. There's only one spirit guide who can help you through all of this, and that is the Holy Spirit, and he only comes and operates through the name of Jesus, through the authority of the name of Jesus. So throughout Scripture, I know a lot of people come from kind of a cessationist mindset or or their exposure to theology or the church has been some sort of um, – very naturalistic view, a moralistic view of religion that we're just trying to be better people. That's that's not the narrative of the Bible. The narrative of the Bible from the beginning to the end, from the first book to the last book, is this battle between spiritual beings that is taking place over the souls of humanity. It's not over land. It's not over power. It is over the souls of humanity. And so if I, if I could just say this, because I feel like dropping this little nugget right here, all the experience I've encountered probably thousands of people who have struggled with demon possession or have had some sort of uh, demonic activity in their homes. Of all of them, there is one key that opens the door to Satan as well as one key that opens the door to God, and it is this, obedience. Who you obey, you open the door to. That's the reason why, we see, we, we sing that song, he's got the whole world in his hands, as if, and we say things like God is in control. Well, in the overarching narrative of human affairs, in the end, yes, God is in control. Until then, the Bible said he has given man authority in the earth. And so he only has access in places where he is granted access. And so we give him access, like you said, through prayer. So when we're dealing with the thinning of the veil demonically, whenever there's been a horrific, a horrific evil has been has taken place whenever that's happened, whether it's mass murder, um, things like this that have happened generally in that spot, history will tell us that individuals will have encounters, hauntings, however it will be defined paranormal experiences because a veil has been opened. 
Now, the same is true, and, and that's the reason why God would mark certain places. Jacob, when he had that latter experience, he marked that place as a portal. He said, I'm anointing this place because I didn't know it was a gate to heaven, and I want everybody else to know that right here is a gate. It's really fascinating. And it's the same thing you've probably heard about Asbury, the Asbury revival that's been taking place yeah. over the last few weeks. What most people don't know is in 1970, the exact same thing happened. In 1970, if you overlap the testimonies of what happened, how it happened, how it reached the world, how the media reacted, what people are saying, it is identical. You can even take pictures and overlap them because why? There's a, there's a tearing away of the veil there and God has an access point there. Now, when you're dealing with demonic portals, they can be closed through prayer, but it can only come through sanctification. You have to sanctify yourself and sanctify that place for the service of God. And if you do that, you can close that portal. If you can't do that, one famed exorcist said, you just need to take a bulldozer to the place. That's the only, that's the only uh, remedy for it. Just blow it all up, burn it down, <laughs> get rid of it. Uh, wow. Uh, you mentioned, and it kind of goes with this conversation, uh, earlier you mentioned about heaven and the reality, like how real uh, and how, uh, because the spiritual existence was before the physical existence, how real yes. is is the spiritual, you know? Uh, and it's interesting because I hear people that have like out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences where they have this experience and they come back to life and they share uh, a lot of times, and even people who with what I was telling you about earlier, this new story I'm working on, I, I will share with you at some point. Um, people are saying it was more real than this reality. And mm. and it, it's it's really catching me that maybe, like that's a, like maybe that's a, a hint or a sign that, uh, that these people are really going through this stuff because uh, I can't tell you how many times recently I've been hearing people saying that, you know, when it comes to an out-of-body experience that they accidentally had, they weren't seeking it, but what they experienced felt more real than what the real we have from day to day. And that can only tell me that you're getting closer to your, to, to the, 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 um, the fundamentals of creation. Does, does that make yeah. sense? Absolutely. And, and you can't explain it away as chemicals in the brain, because when you overlap a lot of the details, you have people from different nations, from different times, different educational background, using the same terminology and seeing the same things cross-culturally and across history. So when we're talking about that reality, a good example of that is when you think of the Mona Lisa, the painting of the Mona Lisa versus whoever the Mona Lisa actually was. If you want to make a comparison, the painting is the life we now live here on this earth. The actual woman is heaven as far as reality is concerned. So when we're talking about reality and how real something is, if you're drawing a picture, the, that picture is as real as the world we're living in, and you are as real as heaven itself. And so it's important for people to recognize that we're not just going, when we, when we die, if you've given your life to Jesus, you're not going to go float around on a cloud for all eternity. It's, it's not like a dream works or something like that, where we're just going to sit on a cloud with a fishing rod. That's, that's not what heaven is. Heaven is a real place. Uh, it's the way it's described. It's described like a planet. And then it's coming back here to the earth that we're coming back here. And so even in our spiritual bodies, when we're resurrected, we're coming back here to rule and reign on this earth. So it's, it's, it's just as real. It's a fascinating subject. Christianity is far more interesting. Oh yeah. I, I think the world has been lying well, and we've been telling the truth really badly. Yeah. Like, like I, I think, and when we were talking about earlier, I think before we were recording about like just how I grew up with spiritual crutches and things like that, it, it was so boring to me. It was just yeah. boring. It, there was nothing relatable to it. And, and, and the idea of heaven was very boring. It, like, like it was just like, I, like it was just the idea that floating on the cloud, being in this this ethereal place where you just stand there and just like, oh, Jesus is great, Jesus is great, Jesus is great, over and over <laughs> For again. Eternity. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, just shoot me now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, today's sponsor is Simply Safe. And simply put, Simply Safe is the best option for you and your home security or office security. In fact, I'm kind of hoping that the Simply Safe camera catches some kind of weird stuff going on because if you listened to the member show last week, or was it two, two weeks ago? 
the member show, me and Jack were talking about some of the weird things happening at the office, and Jack visually saw the doorknob turning. So hopefully we can catch that stuff on video and then put it out for you guys to show you how good Simply Safe works. But listen, Simply Safe has fast protect technology that allows them to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get priority police dispatch or maybe maybe just maybe they should consider ghostbuster dispatch as well just saying with me as a customer you might need it but you can also unlock and lock your doors access cameras and arm and disarm the system with the appy anywhere simply safe has an app that you can do it all right there from the app and right now you can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafecom slash confessionals go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20 percent off your order with interactive monitoring that's simplysafecom slash confessionals there's no safe like simply safe I was having this conversation with uh, my friend Joel, uh, who was with me uh, shooting the film that we were talking about, and um, he was talking about heaven, uh, how like rebuilding heaven here on earth. And I forget how the conversation went, but he and, and, and partly I was like very sleep depraved, so I really wasn't listening very closely. Uh, sorry, Joel, but <laughs> I was really tired. Um, but <laughs> he, he was talking about that, and it's interesting that you bring that up into as well. And I feel like there may be a reason for that, uh, but. Maybe maybe let's expound on that a little bit. And uh, I, I told you when we start talking, it's just it's just very fluent. We just go wherever we go. I love it. Uh, but maybe expound on that a little bit on how what is what is heaven going to be like? And when you when, she, when you mention um, you know be, returning to Earth, so so is Earth a, a new Earth our final destination in where we spend eternity? I mean, maybe just kind of share with people. Well, it's interesting. The last two chapters of Genesis, and one of the ways you know that God isn't, that the Bible was not written by man, because it just drops these nuggets in one passage of scripture and spends no time hyping it. For example, when you talk about Nephilim, or you talk about some of this crazy stuff, the Bible doesn't take time to hype that as if it's trying to keep the reader engaged. God will just drop it in one verse and then just leave it. And you're like, wait, what, what, what did you just say? What's happening? It takes no time to explain anything to you. And the reason for that is because the Bible is not about everything. The Bible is about redemption. That's the theme of the Bible, how he wants to redeem humanity. And so it skips a lot of information that would be truly fascinating. I'm sure when we get to heaven, we'll discuss these things. But the earth was made after the pattern in heaven. So when we're talking about the earth, we're talking about God's taste, what God likes. What's already in heaven was just replicated here on the earth for humanity to partake in, for humanity to enjoy. And so when we see mountains, you can be sure there are mountains in heaven. When you see rivers, there are rivers in heaven, and that's described. So when you go to the book of Revelation, or you go to Ezekiel or Isaiah, when there's these amazing descriptions of heaven and descriptions of angels that would just send chills down your spine, and they're not fat little babies floating around with a, with a bow and arrow. You know, that's, that's, these, these angels are fierce, and every time they show up, they have to tell people don't be afraid because they're just terrifying when, they're, when you're in the presence of them. And when we get to Revelation chapters 20, 21, and 22, we see Christ coming back to this earth to bring his will. This is the prayer that we've been praying for centuries. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so all of history has been culminating to this moment where finally God's will will be accomplished. What we're seeing right now here on the earth is a shadow. It is a worn out facsimile of what God intends for this earth to be. What he originally created the Garden of Eden to be, sin has tainted it, corrupted it, and the curse of this world has polluted it. Satanic forces are ruining it. But in that day, and I believe it's coming soon and very soon, it's going to be restored to what God originally intended. And we're going to be a part of that process. Oh, that's awesome. That's it's awesome. exciting. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, my 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 mom, uh, she's gonna love hearing you say that. So, <laughs> uh, she she um, my mom is uh, the the older she's gotten, the more engaged she has become in just looking uh, at the reality of the situation when it comes to mm. the world we live in, and 
and, and, and sometimes to be honest, it, it gets annoying to some point. Cause it's like, mom, I just want to talk to talk to you about something else. You know, but it's normal all, stuff. That's all she does. It's all she wants to talk about. It's, it's great though. Cause that's what, that's what motivates her in her life right now. Well, I think we just, we over spiritualize things and you know, so there, what was it? This is fascinating to me. When Satan said, I will exalt myself above God, that I will make my throne. What was it about God that made him think? Is there a vulnerability in God? Is there, is it, is it not as apparent that he is all powerful and omnipotent? Certainly he is, but what would make Satan think that he could do that? And then when you look at the fact that there are, there are angels who show up with swords. So if there are swords in heaven, are there blacksmiths in heaven? Are there forges in heaven? If there are, if there are horses, are there stables in heaven? Who constructed those stables? Are there carpenters in heaven? And you just really can start going down that that rabbit hole. And God, the Jewish community has really had this throughout the throughout the centuries that there's not a separation between the natural and the spiritual. It's, it's not separate. It's not okay. Well, this is natural, and this no, it's, it's all intertwined and interconnected. And I think we're going to be shocked at how real heaven is, uh, yeah, as I, well as how real hell is. Absolutely, I. I I think it's something that's just I can't fathom. You know, it, it, as much as the uh, how how real God is, or how big God is, and how God exists outside of time because He created time, so He can't exist inside of time. Like all that stuff is just so mind numbing to me at times. That it's just like I just can't wait to to experience it because it, it's it's got to be the the greatest high ever. You know, it's just like holy cow! Like it's just yes, I, I can't imagine. Um, so. Let me ask you, I haven't even mentioned this to you in anything, but the, the idea of David's mighty men in the Bible uh, is something that like I, these guys were like, like hardcore soldiers that to me seemed like, it's like you got Samson and then it's like, imagine a whole army of Samsons. And, yeah. and, and then you look at Hollywood of the day and how Hollywood has the X-Men. They have all these Marvel movies and it's like, it's like they're trying... Nothing's new under the sun, right? So, like, they're it's trying to replicate. They're yeah. replicating, and mm-hmm. and it, but the thing is, it, I feel like it's it's also it's hurting in a sense because now that's fake, that's not real. It's impossible. But the reality is, it is real. It is possible because we have it written thousands of years ago where there was a super soldier army. Uh, yeah. I mean. Do you, do you do you share that opinion that like it seems like Hollywood is trying to mimic things and in order and that, maybe not Hollywood in itself but like the the satanic environment in Hollywood of course is, is trying to bring down the truth so that it can normalize it almost well the satanic agenda is always to mimic and so when we think of the antichrist we always think of anti against Christ but that's not always the meaning of it sometimes it is anti meaning antihistamine in kind of where we get that in uh, in in from the Greek, it means in the place of, it means to take the place of. And so the antichrist is someone who's not just simply against Christ. He's trying to take the place of Christ. And when we see Satan's agenda throughout history, it has always been, he's not a creator. He's a replicator. He's always trying to duplicate. He's always trying to mimic God. So when, when you see the mark of the beast, for example, where no one can buy or sell, except they have a mark, he's mimicking something. God marks his people. And that you are able to exchange heaven's resources and receive from heaven as a result of that mark. That's a whole other subject altogether. But yeah, when we're talking about David's mighty men, for example, David went up against a giant himself, um, Goliath, which the giants in the Bible are, are collaborate perfectly with the giants we've seen throughout history. Up until the 1800s, it was common knowledge, the late 1800s, it was common knowledge that giants existed. Everybody knew it. Their bones were discovered all over the place, all over the continent of the United States, for example. Abraham Lincoln mentions the giants in a speech um, at Niagara Falls. He talks about them as if it's common knowledge. And then all of a sudden, this kind of, this Darwinian understanding of the world begins to influence everything. And they're trying to replace God. They're trying to remove the supernatural aspects of the world so that we can all be naturalists and only think of what's on the surface. And so all of a sudden, all these skeletons and all these archaeological discoveries start to disappear from the Smithsonian and, and other places. And, and all of a sudden, we're just living in a fully natural world. Whereas if you knew that there were beings 14 feet tall and that God raised up a group of people who were badder than them, 
which is amazing when you think of it. And we're not talking about someone who had a pituitary gland issue that grew. We see this all the time. They can grow to a seven feet tall, eight, nine, 10 feet tall. We've seen this in history, but they're kind of lanky and they're not coordinated. And, and in a lot of instances, not all, but in a lot, we're talking about people genetically disposed to this and perfectly proportioned to being 13 feet tall. The Bible speaks of it multiple times. And yet God raises up an army of men like David who can go after them and take them down. That's why it's really important for your viewers to know. It doesn't matter how powerful these beings actually are, what their scope is. We have more power because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And you can be like David and all by yourself. But if you've got a sling and a stone, you can go after these giants and these entities and these beings. But yes, I believe that Hollywood is attempting to rewrite biblical history and kind of allow it to get lost in the in the pettifogging of of all of these myths uh, that we have in the world today. Which, by the way, I think the myths of like Hercules and others, these demigods, come from the men of renown, the giants from the Old Testament. I think that's where all of that was birthed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's something I, I don't think I ever really connected those dots. I mean, the idea that, you know, David did take down a Goliath and then God gave him an army of giant killers because we know that they were there. Uh, and, and when you look into it, it's like the Old Testament talks about the giants a lot more than what people are comfortable with. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. And I think even, I think even uh, maybe during that story, I can't remember. I, I always butchered this, but I remember years ago reading somewhere in the Old Testament about how uh, David, I think, came across one of Goliath's relatives or something. And it was like, I had, it was, it was, it was wielding a new type of weapon or sword or something. But like, I remember reading about it and, and looking into it and the word sword, it was like a placement word and it, it was really a new type of weapon. And I was mm. like, what could that be? Like, holy cow. Like imagine David, a soldier from the time he was a boy killed Goliath, has a, a, a super soldier army and, we're talking in a time where when you kill somebody, it's up close and personal, and yet they're coming across a new type of weapon. Now I'm thinking to myself, yes. and it's a giant. We know where giants came from. And we know if you look like in, in, in Enoch, it talks about Azazel and teaching like sorcery. And I'm like, was this some kind of like glowing sword that shoots lasers? I don't know. <laughs> like, but it's just like, <laughs> it's like what kind of weapon could be new to somebody that has seen it all? And well, at and in addition to that, yeah, even David himself unsheathed. Most people think that David killed Goliath with the stone. That's not entirely true. He he's the, the Bible uses the word slayed more than once in that story. So he's hit him with the stone. Goliath falls, but then he unsheaths Goliath's own sword, which was advanced technology. We know that from from the scripture. And he uses now. Here's an interesting thing because I think this is what you're doing. He used enemy technology to take the enemy down. And so when we're talking about social media, for example, and this explosion of technology in the world today, which could be the result of, of nefarious demonic type activity, that doesn't mean Christians should be absent from it. We should take Goliath's sword and kill him with his own sword, use enemy technology against the enemy. And that's what we saw in the life of David and, and, and all throughout biblical history. Wow. That's, that's deep. I like it. I like it a lot. That's good. Um, yeah, D David's life has been something that has just been fascinating to me. Just the the way he came up and the the involvement, the the intimate involvement he had with Nephilim, and it's just not. Again, it's just not talked about. And then you hear people try to like pastors trying to explain away Nephilim as, oh, it's just completely natural. It's just let me let me tell you how this really is. It just meant they were really smart. No, right. <laughs> no, that's not what it meant. And, and even with like the book of Enoch, I, I, I've been personally shunned by people, uh, not everybody, but there's been certain people, even pastors who have told me, uh, you reading the book of Enoch is not a good thing. And I'm like, but it, it, it literally, I think it's in the first chapter somewhere. It's a, there's a direct quote in the New Testament. I think it's in Jude from Enoch. And I was like, so it, it, in that, it, because that's pro provable, and underneath your theory, then you should probably stop reading every commentary you use to prepare for a Sunday morning sermon, like yeah. extra canonical book. And so like, like to me, it's clear that the New Testament writers read that book and used it as a tool to be able to convey the message of the gospel to the people of the day. And 
And to me, it's like no different than reading a commentary, like a Matthew Henry commentary or something. Correct. And so when you look at that, pastors, you got to remember, pastors love love God, love people, and they're just concerned. Sure. You know, they, don't, they don't want people going off the deep end, and they don't have time to dig into all this stuff. Um, I, I'm thankful I've had a little bit more opportunity than probably most pastors to kind of dig into this stuff. And, and there's lots of concerns. Is the book of Enoch we have today the same of, as the book that they were referencing? But that doesn't mean we should, as long as people know what they're reading, that they're reading an extra biblical source that may have been tampered with, it may not have been tampered with, uh, that some parts may have been inspired and some parts may have not. There's nothing wrong with that. I think if people are doing that, it's showing that they're interested. It's just going to bring them back to the Bible anyway. And you're right. Jude quotes them directly, specifically referring to these angels um, in Genesis chapter six, who mated with the daughters of men and gave birth to this this race of giants in the world, which is what caused the the flood to have to take place. Yeah, and, and in, like even if I mean, if from what I understand, I could be wrong on this, but it, it, I think the Book of Enoch, as it's understood, probably predates the Book of Genesis, and like. The fact that in the very first chapter, it's prophetical about the coming Messiah. And when you read it, you're like, they're talking about Jesus right there. You know, it, it's just, it's to me, it's, it's really cool because it, you see this book that we hold in our hands written over a thousand year period of time with multiple authors. And it's just constantly uh, paralleled each other to the culmination of Christ and the saving of humanity. Uh, to me, I find that stuff interesting. I yes. like doing those kind of digs, and uh, and that's how you read it. You know, you whenever you're reading these extra biblical sources, you find out where it converges with the canon that we have, the scripture that we have, and then you say, okay, well that then that works, that works right there. And there's uh, some fascinating places where that book kind of converges with uh, our New Testament, Old Testament, and New Testament thought. Even when Paul begins to lay out, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and then he begins to list all of these this tier of satanic activity, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, all these different things that seem to be a hierarchy of demonic powers that we're battling against. And he, he recognized that and he lets the believer know you have armor against these things. But listen, if you don't have that armor, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. And then when you get into the last days, the Bible predicts that there will be this release of these monstrous demonic creatures into the earth. So yeah, the Bible's a good book. We ought to read it sometime. And when we make yeah. these TV shows and these movies about the Bible, you don't have to drift off. I remember when they did Noah and they kind of kind of went kind of crazy with Russell Crowe and Noah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's wild enough without having to do that. You know, you, you can you can stick to the narrative, and it's really interesting. It's it's fascinating. Uh you know, we're we're talking a lot about like uh supernatural power and uh godly power. Um and, and even powers of the uh, of the enemy, you know? And I mentioned to you before we started recording, when I was a kid in high school, the kids are in youth group wearing t-shirts, Satan is stupid. I'm just like, as an adult looking back, I'm like, that's not entirely true. He's been around a long time and he understands this very intimately. Uh, yes. But speaking of supernatural power, um, how do you, and I, and I really mean this because I, I don't know, uh, but how, where are you at with the whole um, healing is for today kind of thing? Because I grew up uh, in a Pentecostal home, and uh, I have a, a grandfather who's passed away. But when I, when I was a kid growing up, I would hear stories about, because he was a washer repairman, uh, washer dryer guy. Uh, but on weekends, he would travel and do evangelistic ministry. And he would tell stories of people heal, being healed. And uh, one time he told me, he, he he directly told me. Well, my dad was there when this happened when he was a kid. But he directly told me that he shouldn't have done this, but he did it anyways. Where when he was praying for somebody, their leg grew to be the right length on stage in front of people, and then he asked God to retract it and grow it again to show that it's really him. And he had tremendous guilt about that. He's like, I shouldn't have tested the Holy Spirit like that. Um, but so you're talking to somebody who does believe that stuff. But I would would like to hear your opinion on it. Well, coming from an atheistic background and then having a dramatic encounter, I began to recognize the validity of the word and how important, how supernatural the Bible is. And so when I began to approach the Bible and just had an insatiable hunger for it, which is very similar to your testimony, I'd, I'd be reading the Bible six to eight hours a day after I was born again, and just hungry to learn what it said and, and went through it several times in, sor in short succession. And what I began to discover in there is that Regardless of what the theological camps believe and whatever denominational upbringing you may be in, 
there's really no, no question within Scripture about what God's will is concerning healing. From Genesis to Revelation, it is God's will for his people to be well. It is God's will for his people to be healed. That's his desire. Well, of course, as a father, isn't it your will for your children to be healed? In fact, if your child was sick, wouldn't you want to take that sickness off of them in order yeah. for them to be well? You take it upon yourself, which is exactly what Jesus did which was predicted in Isaiah 53, fulfilled in the Gospels, and then mentioned again in Peter chapter 2, that he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So as far as healing is concerned, when you go into the New Testament, there is no question concerning God's will. Now, when we get into the application of that and how that works and why, does, why are some people healed and why are some people not healed, there are lots of questions. And, there, and we should approach those questions with humility. And where we get in trouble is, is number one with experiential theology because we have to know, right? I mean, we want to fill in the blanks. And as a result of that, we'll say, well, Aunt Minnie prayed and she served 30 years in the church and she didn't get healed. So therefore, I'm going to create a theological statement based on that. And that's where we get in trouble. The ways of God are innumerable. And what we're battling, when we're talking about sickness and disease, we're battling the curse of this world. We're battling a host of problems that we bring on ourselves, and we're battling a host of problems that we that are on us from no fault of our own. We're battling demonic entities, principalities, and powers, as we mentioned earlier. There's a million reasons why we would struggle with sickness and disease and all of these difficult things. And so we need to understand that just because we don't see it happen the way we think it should doesn't mean it's not God's will. And that's that's when you look at the gospel, the gospel account which was written, by the way, to show you the will of the Father. The purpose of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is to show you who God the Father is, to show you what his desire is, what his will is. We actually only have about 30 days of Jesus' ministry recorded in those Gospels, and look at all that happened in those 30 days uh, that are specifically, if you take the instances out and when they occurred, it's about 30 days. And John says, if you were to write everything Jesus did, you couldn't, all the books in all the world, you would not be able to contain them. So what that tells us is that every instance of healing and deliverance was specifically selected for what? To show us the Father. The disciples said, Jesus, if you'll show us the Father, it'll suffice us. And Jesus said, how long have you been with me? Don't you know that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? He said, I came to do the will of him that sent me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So these instances that are pulled out are pulled out to show us the Father. And what do you see about the Father Every time someone comes to Jesus for healing, every single time he heals them They're without question. Now, there's one instance in particular where he prayed for them and they weren't healed totally. So he had to pray again, which that tells us something that you may not always see it instantly. And when you don't see it instantly, what do you do? You pray again. There's another instant where the disciples were given power over all devils in Luke chapter number nine, all devils and to cure diseases. And 30 verses later, they encounter a situation that they can't deal with. And the guy goes to Jesus and said, your disciples could not cast it out. Well, that's not true. They could cast it out, but something happened. They lost that power. They entered into doubt and unbelief. Something happened that robbed them of it 30 verses later. So obviously, where would we be 2,000 years later? If 30 verses later, they lost the power because they just kind of, like Peter walking on the water, looks at the waves and the wind and starts to sink. That's what happens to us over time. So there's a lot of things we don't understand. When we don't understand, we don't begin to blame God. That's not the thing you should do and say, well, it must have been the Lord's will. That is not the case. It is never God's will for, for his children to be sick ever, ever, ever. It is always his will to heal. But even within that, and you, you can interrupt me because I can just talk about this forever. Go ahead. Even in that, there are nuances. If you were to take a survey, brother, of, of every new parent and say, do you want your child to be a millionaire? Well, when that baby's born, the answer is, yes, yes I want my child to be a millionaire. I, absolutely no question. Now, if you go and revisit that family, seven years later, you got a seven-year-old. Can I give, do you want your child to be a millionaire? Yes. Can I give it to him now? Well, no, mm -hmm. you can't give it to him now. Even though it's my will, it is my will. But if, I, if you give it to him now, he's going to spend it on bubble gum. You know, you can't, can't right. do that. Okay. Well then fast forward now to when the child is 20. Do you want your child to be a millionaire? Yes. Can I give it to him now? Now the answer is uh, it depends. 
what are they doing with their life? Are they addicted to drugs? If I give them that money, are, are they going to harm themselves with it? And so even though it is my will for my child to be well off, as he goes through his life, the, the ability to impart that to him, my desire to impart that to him is dependent upon what he's doing with his life and his level of maturity. So it can be God's will to heal you while at the same time, God is saying, well, I'm not going to heal you so you can go back in the club. You know, it's my desire for you to be well, but I'm not going to make you well so you can sit in a recliner all day and not ever help anybody or do any good. I want to move in your life. I want to, I want to bless you. But if I give you a thousand dollars, are you going to buy, are you going to buy alcohol with it? Or are you going to go help the, the local uh, soup kitchen or help rescue kids out of uh, human trafficking? You know, what are you going to do with it? So when we're talking about the will of God, there's the overarching will, his desire as a loving father. And then there's the practical will of, yes, I want to move in your life, but what are you going to do if I do? You know, and I think that's something that we often forget. We just want a nice, clean answer. And, and if we don't get it, then we'll make something up. Well, it must have been the Lord's will to pick another flower for heaven. And that's just as ridiculous as, as anything. You know, God wants you to live a long, fruitful, healthy life. Will bad things happen? Yes. Will bad things happen to good people? They die before their time? Yes. Why? I don't know. I don't know. A a million different reasons. But here's what we do know. Jesus died to make us well. And it's his desire to fight for that, to vie for that with everything that we can. You say, well, what if I die and I'm praying for healing? Then you died fighting for what Jesus paid for. And when you enter into heaven, there will be thunderous applause because you kept the faith and you fought a good fight. And boy, that was all over the place. But I hope that no, answered a question. No, or no, two. It, it definitely, definitely. Because uh, I asked because I'm somebody who believes that stuff happens. And I've That's never, it. I've prayed for people, never saw somebody come to healing. Uh, but I would be, on, to be honest with you, I refrain. I get very nervous to pray for somebody in the moment for healing, like laying hands on them and praying for healing in the moment because of, I believe it happens, but will it happen now? And if it doesn't happen now, how do I express my, my faith after the fact to the person who did not get healed, you know? And so like, instead of having, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's just like, it's pro- it's clearly a lack of faith on my end it, it, to a certain extent, but like I just uh, well, don't be Monday morning quarterbacking yourself. Now. You, know, <laughs> you don't want to put yourself down and say it's a lack of faith or whatever. Sometimes it's just it, you know you, as you go, th- it's it's tough as you go through life. It's easy to have. There's a lot of Christians who live in kind of a perpetual optimism, and they don't ever look at negative information, and they don't ever they, they just la 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 la. I'm not listening. Bad things don't happen, and everything's going to work out just fine. And that's not what God calls us to do. But he does calls us. He does call us to stand in the midst of all this difficulty and all this sickness and disease, and to stand in faith for what it is that Jesus paid for. And when we do that, and I, you're not the only one. I mean, we all struggle with the same thing. And so, whenever whenever we approach healing, we realize that it's just our job to do what He said to do, not to look for the result, not to hope uh, that it's all going to happen immediately, but just say, you know what Jesus said, lay hands on the sick. So in Jesus' name, I pray that you be healed right now, that that whatever the situation may be. I remember there was a woman who came into my office. She was, and I wasn't a pastor. I was actually running a prayer center at the time. I used, before I was a minister or a a pastor, I ran a prayer center where we took calls from all over the world and people came in from all over the world just to receive prayer. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That was my job. Wow. And uh, there was a woman who came in and she had a a cancerous tumor on her breast. She was going to have to have, um, the surgery that no woman would want to have as a result of that. And it was extraordinarily painful and it was about the size of a tangerine and she was wearing clothes, you know, like, um, sweats because just if anything rubbed it, it was just horribly painful. So I brought in my secretary and I had her lay, lay hands on her and we began to pray. And I said, in the name of Jesus, and this was a passage of scripture that just jumped up in my mind, every plant, my heavenly father has not planted shall be rooted up. And we curse that cancer at its roots down and we command it to leave your body. And I said, now just begin to thank the Lord. And that's a great way to end the prayer, by the way. Just begin to thank the Lord as if it's already done. And just thank him that he's already healed you. On the cross, he already healed you 2,000 years ago. And brother, the power of God hit her and she went into the restroom, took the bandage off. The cancer had fallen off into the bandage. It looked like a, a like an octopus. All the roots and the tentacles 
had come out and it was like it wasn't there, skin like a baby, where the tumor originally was. Now, I don't see that every time. I've seen it multiple times. I don't see that every time I pray, but I'd, I would never see it if I didn't pray. And so we step out in faith. I don't know always, always know where the person is. I try to meet them where they are. Sometimes people, people don't want healing. Sometimes what they want is for to go home and be with the Lord. Sometimes that's what they want. I try to meet people where they are as long as it's biblical and, and scriptural. And there's never any condemnation. I, the moment we begin to talk about that, people all of a sudden begin to think someone's attacking their lack of faith or they didn't receive it. There was something wrong in their life. And certainly there's a percentage of cases where that's the case. Out of almost all the instances that Jesus um, encountered people who were sick, he commented on their faith. Your faith has made you whole. But most of the time, we just don't know. Maybe they've got more faith than the rest of us just to get up in the morning. It takes them more faith just to live their life every single day. And they're battling through hell every day. And their faith is getting them through that part of it. They're just not seeing the manifestation on the other. So it's important that we don't judge or look at the outward circumstances. Just obey the Lord and just, just pray. And then tell them now, just praise the Lord that you're healed. The same thing with sin. Have you been forgiven of sin? Has Jesus removed the power of sin from your life? Absolutely. Do you sin still? Yeah. Well, from time to time. Yeah. That doesn't mean he didn't accomplish that work. And you know, P Jesus said, Peter, come on, let's walk on this water. And Peter was walking on the water. All the pictures you see of this, by the way, is Peter sinking. You never see a picture of him actually walking on the water because that's where our focus is. We can relate with drowning. We can't relate with walking on water. So our emphasis is always on that. But he actually walked on the water. Why? The circumstances uh, surrounded him, just overwhelmed him. And he lost it in that moment. And it's okay to be human and it's okay to struggle and it's okay to be weak, but it's not okay to blame God and say, well, he did this, it's his fault, because that turns God into a tyrant. God's not making people sick. God's not the, not the person dealing out cancer. He's the person dealing out healing. You say, well, what, what if somebody died from it? Then they got healed when they were in heaven. Praise God. There's victory either way if you're a believer, but that's, that's not God. There's a lot of forces we're dealing with, as we talked about in this program, that we have to contend with, and we have to contend with legally, biblically, and uh, and it's a growing process, and we're all learning as we go. Yeah, I I, I, I love what you said, and I definitely I feel like um, it's just it's an act of obedience, and like you said, I mean I'm yes. doing this because I was told to do it. You know, That's exactly it, it's, right. It's not a matter of I I well I, I I'm doing this because I know it's going to work or the, the, the results driven. It's just I was instructed to do it, just like the Great Commission. There's no. It just you just go do it because that's what you're told to do, you know. And, yeah, that's and, it, and that's that's a faith life, right? I mean, that's that's rough. It's no one said it was going to pop up petunias and turn out tulips as you're walking on this road of faith. Everything's going to be perfect. That's not the case. The New Testament says this is a fight, this is a battle. Paul said, "I fought the beast at Ephesus." I mean, this this is a struggle. We are against principalities, against powers. Revelation twelve twelve. In the last days, Satan will come down in great wrath because he knows his time is short. So that means we're going to encounter a spiritual warfare that even the apostles didn't have to encounter. It's just going to get crazy and get wild out there. But we have a hope that goes beyond the scope of what we can see. So when I pray, I don't pray that I see the results. I just pray that there are results, that they are healed. And often people will receive it by faith. And it, it may take a day. It may take two days. Sometimes it's 40 days later. But then it just hits them. But they believed it the moment that they prayed and they were living with those symptoms for 40 days, but something happened after several weeks and then it just, it just hit. That's why I'm working with um, actually a publishing company. To, there was a book from a great general of the faith named Norval Hayes called How to Live and Not Die that so impacted my life as a new believer. I reached out to that publishing company and I've worked with them. We're, we're now relaunching that book, How to Live and Not Die, which teaches people how to pray when they're faced with these situations. And it's such a classic work on faith. It teaches people how to, how to talk to the situation, how to stand on the word of God, how to praise God, how to worship, all that kind of stuff, that, how to take authority over the devil. And it's just a fun journey to learn these things and apply these things and, and not be moved by what you see, but moved by what you believe. Absolutely. I love it. Listen, I, I think I could talk to you forever. We haven't hit on... <laughs> 
on some of the, like, like we haven't really even hit on the end times revelation. I know. And, and, and it, monsters and all that stuff. I, I know like mon- monsters. And I, I had uh, AI and transhumanism here. I'm sure you got thoughts about that. Oh, uh, man. I would really like to do this again sometime with you. Let's uh, do it. And, and, and dive into this stuff. Before, if your audience is interested, if they want us, listen, if they want us to come back, I'll come back. Here's the thing. I just do what I like. And hopefully they like it too. So <laughs> I'm, I, it is what it is. Um, but before we we roll out of here, maybe a, th- a 30,000 foot view kind of thing, because um, you just mentioned it about the, the supernatural aspects that we'll be seeing in those end times. Like, what is it going to be? What, if you could just kind of sum, sum up, what do you think it's going to be like living on earth during maybe the tribulation? You know, uh, and we don't need to get into are you pre or post or all that stuff. Just like, what is that environment going to be like? You're talking about like crazy supernatural stuff happening. Is that what you think? Yeah. And it's interesting. Anytime there's about to be a mass deliverance, when God is about to raise up a deliverer, supernatural signs and wonders begin to take place. Whether you, it's with Passover and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, or if you look at the signs around Jesus first coming, uh, there were supernatural things, angelic encounters and visitations and and things that were happening then. And we're going to see the same thing. Even Joel chapter two says there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will dream dreams. Your old men will see visions. So there's there's always two sides to the coin. There's the redeemed side and there's the unredeemed side. So when we're whenever we're getting into divine activity, there's two sides of that coin in the same way in Egypt. There was when there was darkness, gross darkness, like a, a physically palpable darkness, darkness so black it make your eyes ache. There was light in Goshen. And so there's two sides to that coin. So when we're talking about what's happening during the tribulation, we were talking about a supernatural outpouring of wrath, the likes of which the world has never seen before. We're talking in just in the first few months, a third of the earth's oceans and fresh water being corrupted and polluted and life being killed, a, a half of the population being taken out in roughly three and a half years. And then the Bible says in Revelation 9 that there's portals opened in the Euphrates River, which will be an interesting thing to talk about in the future. And these demonic entities come out like locusts, but they're not locusts. And there's a fascinating description of what they look like. And they sting men and they that causes horrific pain for, for months and months and months. And so there's going to be this kind of supernatural outpouring because the hand of God is removed. There's a restraining force in the earth right now that is hindering Satan from tormenting humanity the way he wants to. God soon and very soon is about to remove that restraining force because man has asked him to. He's not doing it because he hates humanity. They just keep saying, I don't want anything to do with you. And so God eventually is going to honor that and remove that restraining force. And when that happens, there's going to be a loosing of satanic trouble, the likes of which we've never seen before. That's truly supernatural. And we'll have to talk more about that in a future broadcast. But yeah. you don't want to be here for that. You, you don't want to be susceptible for that. You want to get everything right with God right now uh, so that he can cover you and protect you. Yeah. Well, whoo. Uh, we're going to, we're going to get into it again on a future time. Uh, I know I said this last thing, but one more thing, cause you just jogged sure. my memory on it. You, t- you mentioned portal hell, all that stuff earlier. You meant you're rattling off of locations about like examples. And you said one, and you said, we'll get to that in a minute. And we never got to it. Like, like, Oh man, is that, is that, is that something you could relay real quick? Well, one of my, one of my favorite ones is I think it's pronounced Huska Caskell. A castle. It's the Huska Castle in the north of Prague in the Czech Republic. And it's this really odd place where, and we've got a TikTok on this, as a matter of fact, or it's on Instagram, where they've built this castle, but it, there's no water running to the castle. There's no rooms in it. There's not a kitchen in it. There's no fortifications. In fact, when you look in it, it seems to be built to lock what's inside from getting out instead of from what's outside getting in. And it's believed that there was a portal to hell that was discovered and that when it was discovered, they even lowered a prisoner down there in the midst of the construction. Uh, It was reported that he would get a full pardon if he was willing to be lowered down into that pit that they discovered. And when they did, they brought him back up. He was screaming and yelling. He had aged considerably and died a few days later, according to some reports. And so they built this castle to keep what's that portal to keep it in. 
And it's fascinating. People travel there all over the world to visit it. And some say, well, it was just a castle that was built to house documents. Then why were the Nazis there doing all kinds of research mm. during World War II? The Nazis went there and were trying to unlock something. And you, and you know, I'm sure in your studies that um, Germany was fascinated with the occult and was trying to tap into demonic power and to open portals. And so they were spending a lot of time here at this particular place in the Czech Republic. And uh, a lot of people have been interested in it and it asked us. So we did a video on it. And here's what I know. I don't know whether that is an actual portal to hell, but I do know that hell is a reality and that you can be freed from it. You don't have to go there if you trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Pastor, I appreciate you coming on and talking with me. This has been awesome. That's my pleasure, man. Had a blast. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, share the show with your friends, your haters. I don't care who you share the show with. Just share the show if you enjoyed it. That's the best thing you can do to help this show grow is to share the show. So thank you very much for that. Listen, friends, I really appreciate y'all being here. Thanks for listening on a weekly basis. And until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free. But first, it'll piss you off. Bye. Source from the cherubim lies on me like wings from a seraphim.